morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you this morning? I'm en route to work. I uh, didn't record a video yesterday, very sad day. Our dog, our remaining dog, of the two dogs we had for 14 years, unfortunately passed away. Had to have the vet round. Very sad. I hate this whole life death thing. Very depressing. It's depressing to lose a dog, but it's, you know, just questions of your own mortality come to the fore at times like that and, uh, you know, well, not that we euthanize humans so much nowadays, we used to. My father's generation was quite frequently uh, put to sleep with a large dose of morphine by accident, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But uh, they sort of frowned upon, so post shipment, they sort of they frown upon that now. Can't think why. Anyway, it's another lovely day in paradise. Some fluffy cumulus. I was up at five o'clock this morning. Why angry were you up at five o'clock this morning? I know you're saying, why? And the answer was, I went to sleep at six o'clock last night. So I came home and I was just so exhausted with all the emotion and the sleepless nights of the past few days I uh, I just went to sleep at six o'clock and then I woke up about nine and you know like you think to yourself well was that was that a snooze or you know did I do have I just dozed off or whatever and the, and the answer was I couldn't get my eyeballs open so I decided just to go to bed so I just woke up early this morning so and it's lovely at five o'clock you know I am a great believer in double summertime and most of you probably know what I'm going on about but basically it's it's a it's just a different way of setting the clocks whereby you we we basically we coordinate with European time and in the uh, we keep the summer time during the winter <laughs> which doesn't make it any warmer in the winter just because we have got summer time but basically we keep the in the spring when the clocks go forwards you uh, that you we go into British summertime and then in the autumn we make this ridiculously stupid mistake of putting the clocks back and the reason why it's stupid is because we there are there are hundreds of hours of days that we miss we stay up in hundreds of hours of darkness in order to miss one hundreds of hours of daylight in the morning and there's nothing it's no at no time is it more apparent than this time of year when you can get up at five o'clock it's a lovely day there's no clouds in the sky at that time in the morning really the sun is, is when it comes up it's quite strong and if you get up at sort of seven or eight o'clock and you're out by eight or nine as most people are every day is a cloudy day but if you get up at five every day is a sunny day because the clouds don't really bubble up until the sun started coming up and <clears throat> by this simple change to the to the clocks which would make absolutely no difference to anybody whatsoever don't let anyone tell you about the Scottish sheep farmers or uh, old gods make absolutely no difference to anybody whatsoever would mean that we could it would stay light in the evenings till about 10 or 11 o'clock. Think of the barbecues, think of the open air events, think of the, all the activities that we could enjoy after work if it stayed light until 10 or 11 o'clock in the evening. And what would we sacrifice? Nothing. We would, it would still be light in the morning. We wouldn't have to get up in the dark. The children wouldn't have to go to school in the dark. It would be absolutely fine. There would be the same number of hours of daylight in the day. The sun wouldn't come up any less or go down any more. Everything would be it's a technical, a small technical change to the way we set the clocks would just make such a massive difference to everybody's quality of life. And uh, you know, and it's a it's a testament to the failure of the governance system in this country that we've not. Now, now you can say, okay, angry. Just set your own bloody clock. Just leave the rest of us alone. Set your own clock an extra hour forward. 
and then you can live your life an hour ahead of everyone else. That'll keep you happy. And But I mean, that's really not the point, is it? The point is that all the things that I would go to in the evening that would get organized because there was so much extra daylight are not getting organized. And it's all very well for me to get up and, you know, drive to work at six o'clock in the morning and when there's not another car on the road, that's great. I get the benefit of the roads being clear, but no other buggers around, you know. There's, nobody, <laughs> there's no patients at six o'clock in the morning to, uh, to, to treat, because they're all asleep. And they're missing the best hours of daylight. They really are the best early hours of daylight, you know, the sort of the first three hours are the best. They're the best where the, everything looks lovely. It's a lovely new day. The uh, garden looks fantastic and there's not a cloud in the sky. Um, where are we? We're in bed. We're asleep through that lot. And you wake up and your eyelids open and you think, oh, that's good, it's daylight. But it's not actually just daylight just because you've woken up. It's, you know, you're, you're like a third of the way through the day already, but you just don't even know it. The wildlife know it. I mean, if you wake up at five o'clock and go down and make yourself a cup of tea, there'll be rabbits on the lawn. You got rabbits on the lawn. <laughs> Where did they come from? And the answer is they just got up. When, when the sun come up, they got up, you know? But it's a nice time for them because they know that all the humans won't, will be lying in until late morning for them, like early afternoon. Oh dear. Talking of animals, we had a woman in yesterday, she had this massive great plaster under her chin, like a sticking plaster. And when people have got things like that, you know, I always say, like, if someone's got like a mole on their forehead or a patch or something, I always say, what's that on your forehead? You know, what's that patch on your forehead? <laughs> and the nurses always go, well, oh, Derek, you always do, why'd you say all these things, you know, we wouldn't dare say, you know, what's it, and I'm like this woman, so what's that bloody great plaster under your chin? So I don't know, I mean, she could have a squamous cell carcinoma under there that she's nursing because she doesn't know what it is or who to ask. She could be a massive great fistula from a leaking wisdom tooth or something, I don't know. I need to know, I'm entitled to ask anything from the neck up and certainly uh, other times in other areas as well. I'm entitled to ask. And I ask it on the first visit because if you don't do something on the first visit, people will say, no, it's so important. Why didn't you ask me that on the first visit? So on the first visit I do, I'm, I'm careless, reckless. I ask anything and everything. You only get one chance, so I ask it. But apparently she was attacked by a cat. She didn't say whether it was her cat or someone else's cat. She described it as a particularly vicious cat, which I would leads me to suspect it possibly wasn't her cat, because why would you keep a particularly vicious cat? Unless you didn't know it was a particularly vicious cat at the time, that was an opinion that you formed after it had attacked your chin. However, that's beside the point. The point was that uh, she had a pain with a problem with her toothache on the top right hand side and the problem was that she'd had an absolutely rubbish, rubbish composite felling done on her upper right 7DO which had left a massive great gap between the 7 and the 8 and apparently this dentist, her last dentist had had two attempts at doing this and, uh, and you know and if this second attempt was <laughs> I can only assume the second attempt was better than the first I mean, in which case God knows what the first one looked like but there was literally a two millimetre gap going on for between the 7 and the 8 and she's getting food stuck up there and you know and she said it's painful but my previous dentist said he only had two goes at filling this and then told me it was I've got gum disease that's my problem I've got gum disease but um I'm like, uh, okay, let's have a look. Well, she's she's a sort of patient you have to be quite careful with because they ask you questions that um, really you're not entitled to comment on, and uh, you have to be you have to be if the, if you get a patient like that you have to pick them up you know you have to sort of think ah oh, I know this what type of patient this is she's the sort of patient that's going to press me for information and then you know like not trick you but sort of uh, encourage you encourage you to say something which you later regret and maybe used against you in a court of law 
So, I mean, a typical example, for example, is, I mean, let me, let me just finish off about the, 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 the case in point. The, the, what happened was this previous dentist was, having failed to close the gap, right, between these two teeth, twice, had then, rather than say to the patient, yeah, I think we need to try a third time, and to give him his due or her due, <laughs> by that point, they obviously had sort of come to terms with their limitations they probably knew in their heart of hearts that a third go was not going to get it was not going to do any better than the first two so okay credit where credit is due but they then said oh no it's not the fault is not my feeling oh no which it is uh, no I'm disease um, so what you need to do is you need to come and see the hygienist every two months and she will treat your gum disease and uh, hopefully that will make the problem better and what they meant was come and see the hygienist to sort of try and do some sort of deep scaling in this gap which is constantly getting food jammed in it and um, see if uh, we can just alleviate the symptoms enough to make you go away well the you know the first rule of gaps between teeth is that you can't leave gaps in between teeth you cannot do it especially you know in these back teeth where people have got other teeth missing and the teeth have moved a bit so usually you've got like one lower teeth biting directly in between two uppers or one upper tooth biting directly in between two lowers and they've all tilted a bit etc etc and if you've got a gap in between teeth the first rule of gaps is that or the second rule the first rule of gaps is that you mustn't have a gap the second rule is that uh, uh, Patients can bite and chew food into gaps faster than they can clean it out, let alone a hygienist on a two monthly basis. So um, she needs some sort of urgent solution to this gap problem, which I told her, you know, and it's difficult because you've had a patient, you've been to a dentist, I think she'd been to two dentists, uh, not, uh, but I think one dentist had tried to fill it twice, and then, um, you know, so she's coming to a third dentist who's telling her that she needs to have it filled. And that's quite difficult advice. You think to yourself, well, how is she going to react to that? Well, the answer is you, 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 it's not up to you to worry about how she's going to react to that. If that's the correct advice, then that's, that's the advice that you need to give her. You need to say to her, look, this, your problem is that you need, you need to have this refilled to close the gap because it's going to jam up with food faster than you can clean it out. And, I, you know, she understood that. She understood that. What she probably didn't understand was why the previous dentist hadn't fixed it. But that's between her and the previous dentist. But then I'm going to come back to that right later. So, we're taking x-rays of the teeth. And, you know, and she's got... She's, she's an NHS... She's sort of, a, in a way, she's a sort of a typical NHS case in that she's got... She's got quite a high decay rate and yet she's got crowns, yeah? So, you know, I said to her, has anybody ever had a chat with you about your diet? And she said, no, or oh, wait a minute, a dentist did once mention that it might be sugar. She said, but I thought about that and I decided that I don't eat a lot of sugar, therefore it can't be that. All right, so, so there immediately, and we had two of these patients yesterday. I had another one in yesterday who, who has basically got a very healthy mouth a nice woman in a sort of early 30s probably late 20s early 30s and um, but argued argued with me about whether uh, brushing was important whether uh, what did she last you know I mean just re completely refused to accept that uh, what the, the conventional or my conventional theory of plaque uh, causing <laughs> irritation of the gums leading to <laughs> destruction of tooth support, leading to tooth loss in later life. And um, uh, she pushed it a bit further yesterday because as you know, we, we disclose everybody's teeth. And she said to me like, do you mind not um, disclosing my teeth today? I said, okay, I mean, obviously, you know, no consent, therefore no treatment, so fine. But you know, what's the idea? And she said, well, because, you know, it didn't wear off uh, last time, it didn't wear off for about a day and a half, which is complete. Cods wallop. I mean, you know, when this stuff wears off after about 10, 15 minutes. So, so she's lying to me. Okay, it's a, she's lying to me. She thinks that it's a plausible lie. She thinks that I can have no idea of how long it took to wear off in her mouth. Therefore, I can't 
even I won't even suspect that she's not telling me the truth. But obviously, I know I know how long this, this stuff lasts, you know. And uh, if it didn't wear off for a day, I would be inundated with people telling me that it hadn't worn off for a day. Even as a curiosity, even as a laugh, people would say to me. Carl, you know that stuff. It did. It was so funny. I went down the pub. I showed everyone. I still had a blue tongue, like and a day later. And that doesn't happen. So there we are. So she's sitting there saying, saying, I've decided how you should do your job, and um, uh, and I've decided that I you shouldn't be staining my teeth up. That's what it was. So there's a direct challenge to your authority there. And it's sort of quite harmless and it's done in a nice way and everything. But but basically, you've got a patient there who thinks that they know better than you do. And these patients are very dangerous. They're very dangerous. Um, and in fact, if I remember correctly, the, the reason why we, we didn't fall out, but the reason why she was flagged up last time was because she came in and she had this tiny little bit of scale on her lower teeth. And where people have just got like a tiny bit of scale in between their central incisors or something I've been known to do a hand scale and and a polish on those two teeth and then I, I we don't charge for that we just say it's part of the checkup we charge uh, 58 pounds for a checkup I can hand scale two teeth within that fee okay but then you get a very occasionally you get a patient said oh and can I come back and see the hygienist and you say well uh, the hygienist a job of the hygienist ideally you know it's really just to take off any scale that you can't clean off yourself personally and what you're doing is you're saying you're really saying that the onus on you the onus is on you to keep your teeth clean the hygienist is there really just to help you when something needs doing that you can't do yourself right but um, some patients don't see the hygienist like that they see the hy hygienist like they do the hairdresser they say I like to have my uh, I like to have a, a cropodist do my toes I like to have a hairdresser do my hair and I like to have the hygienist clean my teeth and it, that puts you in a very difficult position because if a patient's a plaque free zone and they've got no scale or calculus or any sign of gingivitis let alone periodontitis plus you've done a full mouth perio chart and they're absolutely fine what do you say if they say I want to see the hygienist and this woman didn't really want to take no for an answer and she got annoyed last time when I said to her you don't need to see the hygienist she's like you know uh, she, she it's not so much that um, you know I object to people wanting things done for cosmetic reasons I mean it, I'm sure your teeth do feel nicer when the hygienist has been round and polished them all up but but that's not you know the way I don't think hygienists should be used that way I think the hygienists are there for the treatment of periodontal conditions primarily and not they're not cosmetic they should not be cosmetic only and then they do get some patients do it do do treat them like that but it my my fundamental the underlying fundamental point I'm trying to make is that the patient is is mentally not in the right place when they ask you a question like that because what they're doing is they're saying to you look I cannot be bothered to look after my own teeth I would like to devolve that responsibility to the hygienist okay so so and you have to jump on that straight away because a patient who does not believe that it is their responsibility ultimately to look after their own teeth is is going to be a problem for you you know because anything that then goes wrong with their teeth is going to be your fault because you didn't look after them properly or the hygienist didn't look after them properly so anyway so yesterday she told me that she didn't want me to do a disclosing solution on her te teeth either and I said to her look you know you're I'm trying to get you more into like a preventive mindset of search and destroy of this bacteria and she said well you know up, you know, up to now I've got pretty good teeth and my previous dentists haven't been very preventive so um, what you know I can't see your point so me and her we're gonna diverge at some point I've got you know I mean there you've got a lovely patient nice no nothing wrong with her personality wise but from a, um, other than the fact that there's a conflict with her about really how I should be doing my job and I can't really tolerate patients coming in starting to tell me how to do my job she'd be better off seeing another dentist almost certainly almost certainly very reluctant to get rid of her but very she's very close to that doesn't think that she is but she is like she came within a gnat's whisker of me saying to her I'm sorry I don't think I can help you still considering that anyway um, back to this other the cat lady um, you know, we set, I've just taken an x-ray of the gap, showed her the x-ray on the on the digital x-rays, which are instantaneous, and so she can see there's a big gap in between her teeth. 
but she at this point she was saying to me yeah uh, yeah the, my previous dentist told me that actually the, the problem there is, is a gum problem and um, you know um, she just said to me can you just run past a few gum conditions with me I can't quite remember what it's called can you um, can you just uh, you know mention a few gum diseases and I'll, if I if you say something that I recognize I'll sort of I'll say yeah 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 that's it and I'm thinking no, I'm not gonna play this game you know because you're inviting me to make up something that you're gonna then say oh yeah yeah that's what I've got I've told I was got I mean you, you if you either don't know what you've got or you haven't got something that you would like I am not gonna invent it for you <laughs> So. I said to her, and, and also on the way out, she was like, you know, what would you say? What would you, I mean, just what's your comment? I mean, you know, off the record, what's your opinion on a dentist who does X, Y, or Z? And I'm like, well, you know, and really, I mean, there's only one thing you can say. You can say, I'm sorry, I wasn't there at the time. I don't know what the situation was. I don't know what the state of your teeth are like, and etc., etc. So, but when you get a, when you get a patient who's like, she said she doesn't think that um, decay causes <laughs> decay is caused by sugar, and but, and I said to her, look, you haven't just got six fillings in your teeth, you've got six fillings in every tooth. <laughs> every tooth been filled six times, and crowns, etc., 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 and nobody's ever discussed your diet with you. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, we but we don't uh, we don't know. That would drive me mad, wouldn't it? Really? Something, you know, if I, if one, my arm, my arm was falling off, and I hadn't actually even got a theory as to why, I would, I'd be going ballistic trying to find out why. But for some reason, people that, you know, their teeth con constantly going decayed. I don't know whether they think it's they've inherited it. Her parents were cousins, by the way. That's the I've never heard of that before. She said, you know, my my um, two my two grandfathers were brothers. Oh dear! Well, you know it surprises you every day, doesn't it? This job every day something, something weird comes in. But anyway, I've just uh, quoted her for for um, filling these, and we might need to join these teeth back together. I told her I might need to put a filling across the gap because it really is very big now, and it may be that uh, one or other of these teeth is drifting. In which case, if we don't do something to secure them, then they're going to drift apart anyway, and the gap might open up again. And I don't want to be the third dentist to get it wrong, you know. So um, so that was yesterday's challenge. But you'll have your own challenges. You don't need to listen to my challenges. Tell me about yours. Okay, let's share. All right, I'll, uh, I'm off to work. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.